In Live on Live this Wednesday, we're going to take a look back at the life and work of one of France's most influential cartoon writers. This year, on November 5th, to be precise, marks the 40th anniversary of the death of René Goscinny, remembered for his comic strip creations such as Lucky Luke or Lucky Luke, Is No Good, and Le Petit Nicolas or The Little Nicholas. But the one creation he is globally remembered for, along with his collaborator and illustrator, Albert Uderzo is Asterix the Gaul. Now, the adventures of Asterix and his faithful friend Obelix have been translated into dozens of languages and recount the tales and travels of the indomitable Gauls of Armorica, which is in modern-day Brittany, who hold out against the Roman occupation of what was then France, mainly thanks to their magic potion that gives them superhuman strength. Now, today I'm joined by author and director Guillaume Podrovnik, who recently released the documentary film René Goscinny, Our Uncle from Armorica. It is great, Guillaume, to have you on the programme Thank today. You. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. Now... This film was aired just a few do a few days ago, if I believe right, on the Franco-German right. television channel Arte. But first and foremost, let's look into the documentary. What inspired you to actually do this look at uh, the life of René Goscinny? Well, I can't say I was inspired to do it. It's uh, because last year was the 70 years of uh, the creation of uh, Le Quiluc, so mm -hmm. one of his iconic uh, comic books. And uh, and this, this year, because there were all the exhibitions in Paris, uh, so two, one at the French Cinematheque and one at the Museum of Art and History of uh, Judaism. Uh, and so... Arte, because they, 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 they wanted to team with, uh, with, uh, with all this and uh, have a documentary to... to, to you to did a documentary on Lucky Luke, I believe, yeah, last year. Yeah, I did year, last yeah. year. So, because they thought, OK, I did Lucky Luke, so probably I knew a little bit already the sort of work of this, this guy. And I was asking you before we went on air there, uh, Russian, uh, sorry, Polish origins. He's, he's from a Polish-Jewish background. Yeah, right. With a name like Podrovnik, it's obviously coming from <laughs> yeah. Eastern Europe. There's no, there's, there's no, no correlation. Total coincidence. <laughs> the total coincidence. But now, let's look into the actual life of Goscinny himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was born in France. He moved at a very young age to Argentina. He was mm -hmm. born in uh, 1927, I 26, believe. 26. And, uh, that's he moved it. to Argentina two, uh, when he was two years yeah, old. Yeah, so he was oh. only a baby. Uh, but he spent his formative, kind of young adult years as a comic strip writer in New York. And this was, of course, under the wings of a one Harvey Kurtzman, mm -hmm. who went on to found the iconic magazine magazine, Mad Magazine, if mm. anybody remembers Mad and it's still going out, the big-eared, freckled kid who's on the cover. <laughs> um, but he was, the, the Mad Magazine was founded in 1952, but uh, Goscinny was there before all of this really took hold. What did he learn when he was in New York? I think it, 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 for me, it, it's funny because people, when they, they talk about Goscinny, usually remember the puns. Which, mm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. he did so many puns and bad ones too. And uh, But I think for me, it's, it's why his work is still remembered. What is so important about his work is structure. He's a master of uh, na narration, uh, narrative structure. Uh, and I think that's very, very Anglo-Saxon, if you wish, or American. So when he kind of, when he moved back to France, and we'll move on to uh, his, his, the next project mm -hmm. after um, he left New York, but when he moved back to France, did he come back with a kind of, as you would say, Anglo-Saxon irreverence? Was he breaking the mold? Was this something that nobody Definitely. had ever seen? I think he's the most non-French of the French writers. He's, he's totally, uh, uh, he's been raised on uh, on. on South American comics in Argentina, a little bit of French uh, French comics like Les, Les Pieds Niclés and mm -hmm. all that. But but mainly his, his uh, passion was for American cinema and comedy, Laurel and Hardy, Buster Keaton, uh, Western movies, and uh, and then he spent seven years in New York. So the first time he came back to live in France, he was twenty six. Yes, so it was. He was a, he was a, he was a bit of a foreigner in his own land, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, absolutely. So let's look into um, what happened then when he did come back to France, and this is of course the foundation of Pilot mm -hmm. magazine uh, in the nineteen fifties. That this was a big collaboration of bringing people together. It was uh, it was Franco-Belgian or was it mainly French? Totally French. It was totally French. Of course, a, it would be a Belgian a, market. Was, the original idea was mm. so, so the first people. It was, I think it was Radio Luxembourg and uh, other people. Mm. They wanted to do because there were only Belgian comics, and, uh -huh. and they wanted to do a, uh, a, a magazine, a comics magazine, which was really French, and that's why they did Asterix. Exactly, because they were told, if I remember this correctly, they were told this was coming up to uh, the launch 
launch of the actual, um, the, the first edition of Pilot, I mm -hmm. think it was coming up to 1959, mm -hmm. where both Goscinny and Uderzo were told, OK, well, we're going to print in three months' time. You have to come up with a, a comic strip that extols the heritage of France. So they were looking through the mm. periods of France, you know, be it through Romans, be it before that. Yeah. And, and then they came up with this idea because there had been some... Uh, there had been some friction with other cartoon, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, comic strip writers about trying to find something truly French, but they came up with the magic plan, and that was the Gauls fighting the Romans and not the other way yeah. around. Which was, there was two, two, two interesting, uh, two, two good things about that. Nobody ever did a comic book about uh, a comic story about uh, about the Gauls, and the second thing, nobody actually knew what the Gauls were. So, so it gave them a tremendous, a very broad. Uh, 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 field to work on because y you could say almost everything you wanted. Nobody knew what we were talking about uh, apart from the, you know, the, uh, in school in France, you just hear yeah, that it was very well or ancestors, but. Yeah. But nobody honestly, really nobody of, knows. Because I mean, it all kind of just felt, oh yeah, well, basically the goals are lost, the Romans took over yeah. and that's where we got our culture from. Yeah. But then, they, I mean, one could actually say that these guys changed it because even the popularity of Asterix when it started in the first edition, I had some figures that I was reading about and because there's these special editions coming out mm -hmm. here in France about the life of René Goscinny. So I bought that a few days ago and was reading through it. It's an incredible read where on their first edition that was launched in 1959, 6,000 copies mm -hmm. were sold. Second edition, 20,000. Third edition, 40,000. And then as it developed up until 1966, they were pumping out 900,000 copies, and mm. it was all because of Asterix and Obelix. Yeah, yeah. Why do you explain that phenomenon? Was it because this was something that no one had ever seen before? I think it was really good. Mm. Uh, I, well, the, I mean, the script was fantastic. Uh, I think there's another element to it, and that's I think is something he, he learned with Kurtzman, uh, John Severin, Jack Davis, all the all the American cartoonists. They were really really hard working people. I mean, the the, the, the thing at this time was uh, cartoons were, were published weekly in weeklies, and uh, so you have to carry on every week, and you have never stop. There was no no pause. Mm -hmm. There was not a single issue without uh, without a, um, a, an episode of your heroes. So, which means some some years there was free. I think one year there was four albums who were out. Wow. So. I mean, I've, it's a big it's a element. It's, it's, it's like it's like the the, the ancestor of a TV series. It's sure. a, it's, it's a binge binge. Uh, I got your reading. binge reading <laughs> yeah. and co compiling of yeah. all of these things. But the other thing as well is it really have to see you know the, the success that um, that Asterix has had, but also it went around the world. It was almost viral around the planet. I mean, it's uh, it, 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 it's been translated in almost, I think, 40 languages from Hindi to Latin, of course, mm -hmm. which features <laughs> quite prominently in it. But when this success actually actually came, you know, when, when Pilot and Asterix really came to its zenith, and even there was a, the France's first satellite launched mm, yeah. in 1966, <laughs> was named Asterix-1. Yeah. Um, but when all of this success came. Were there any tensions that came out between Goscinny and Uderzo? Did they ever, you know, did it compromise their success, if you will, or their relationship, the success of our Astros? No, I don't no. think so. Mm. I think I think they've always been very, very good pal. And, uh, I, I mean, Goscinny had problems with Maurice, uh, the, 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 the That's for Lucky for Luke. Luke. Yes. But I think with Uderzo, Uderzo is a really nice guy. And I think Goscinny was too. I mean, mm. really, uh, I, the problems came way later mm. with, with, the, with the, the children and uh, and well, of course, but... after Goscinny's death in yeah. 1977, Udozo did come, he, he continued the Asterix mm -hmm. franchise, yeah, basically. Yeah. But the writing, as I think they all said, well, the writing, I remember reading them myself and go, mm. oh, yeah, anything mm. after 1977 is like, sure. eh, it's not the same. But well, you, you don't know? kill the Golden Goose. Oh, yes. well, of <laughs> course not. You can't kill the Golden Goose. But let's look back to um, the actual making of uh, this documentary that you did. What, you know, what surprises did you, did you find out um, when researching René de Goscinny, anything that uh, came and struck you and said, "My God, I never well, knew that." I think the, more, the, the, the most surprising, because I didn't, ever, didn't even know it existed, was that his father was uh, working for the Jewish Colonization Association in, in Argentina, mm -hmm. which was basically uh, uh, finding work and, uh, and uh, terrain for for Jewish fleeing Europe for, for the Russian pogroms and, yeah. and the Nazis, and um, so you had like a intellectual, you know. 
uh, East, uh, East, Eastern Europe Jews who would have, I don't know, who went, do went doctors, down to like, yes, of course. <laughs> well, they, these would have been yeah, well off people. Well, yeah. to, they, they, they need suddenly to grow cotton in, in, in the pampa. And mm. <laughs> were so they were literally, loss. they were like ducks out of <laughs> yeah. water. Yeah. And I didn't even, yeah, of course, it was uh, Ashkenazi Jews who, who didn't really want to, uh, they, they were not religious. That's why they were going to Argentina and not. Mm. Palestine or whatever, mm. and uh, and they were completely at a loss, and I didn't even know there were there were archive of that, and you you really see you know psy so, psychoanalysts well, exa analyst <laughs> out there in the field <laughs> with a straw hat, <laughs> oh, no, awesome. hanging out with the gauchos yeah, yeah, yeah. down the path. And you understand why in Lucky Luke after you see there was there's so many uh, scenes with settlers who are totally not uh, uh, totally afraid of their new life uh, because he knew that he saw that. Now I have to say we're running out of time. I mean, of course, uh, one question I did like want to ask about well, what's his legacy to comic strip writers? But that we're going to have to look at yeah. another day because it is a, a rich legacy <laughs> that's huge. been left behind. Uh, Guillaume Bodrovnik, <laughs> author and uh, director, thank you very much for being on the program thank today. You.